Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many friends, colleagues, and students this evening. I'd like also to acknowledge the generosity and vision of Carl and Martha Tack, who have been making this series possible for more than seven years, as well as Jane Barnard and Val Cushman and their committee, who have successfully launched 100 Years of Women at the College of William and Mary. An exceptionally warm welcome to Catherine Rowe, William and Mary's new president, arguably William and Mary's woman of this year. Good evening, good evening to the people of the William and Mary community beyond campus, to friends from Windsor Mead and The Landing, and to my family, many of whom came to town for September 12th, but knew, who are now scattered about the world. Finally, thank you to those TAC lecturers who have gone before me, those who I've seen anyway, and so I'll mention Chuck Bailey, Deb Steinberg, Adam Potke, Anne-Marie Stock, Kitty Preston, and Bruce Campbell. And together, let's put our hands together, 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 uh, for the Middle Eastern Music Ensemble, who just performed a set of pieces relevant to this evening's lecture. I'll, I'll just say here that these folks are serious, they're fun, they're loyal, and we've played three performances this week. We were in Richmond performing on stage with the Richmond Symphony last Wednesday, and we were at Salisbury University on the Eastern Shore on Friday, and we're here today, and I'm thinking about giving us the day off on Thursday. We'll check, check in on that later. All right. I can walk around, right? Um, I study musical arts. Here we go. I study musical arts in Indonesia, beginning with the culture of Quranic recitation among women and men and boys and girls. I'm interested in the transmigration of artistic aesthetics, performance practice, and social ideologies around the Indian Ocean, and particularly from the Eastern Mediterranean Arab world and the Arab Gulf to Southeast Asia, the repertoire we just played being examples of such phenomena. As a musician and a student of Arab musical practices, I often participate or share performance through rehearsals and public presentations with practitioners in Indonesia. And this kind of exchange has led to extraordinary opportunities for the creation of collaborative knowledge with a wide range of consultants. My first research, actually let's go back for a minute. Um, my first research, supported by graduate training in Arab lang Arabic language and Middle Eastern studies, was among the Arab American community. But my interest turned to Indonesia when our family had the opportunity to spend the academic year of 1995-96 in Jakarta. I didn't have a specific project in mind, but since Indonesia is the country with the, the largest Muslim majority, I knew that the performance of Arabic language in recitation and singing was likely to be audible, and it was. My first steps into this world in 1995-96 led to a full year supported by a Fulbright grant in 99, many shorter trips in the 2000s, and just recently in country during spring 2017. My work in Indonesia is a bit of a myth buster. It deals with women and music and Islam. I'm interested in two complementary processes, the Islamization of Indonesia and the Indonesianization or the indigenization of Islam. I study the festivalization of, relig of religion, as I call it, and religion in the public sphere. Performing fieldwork and engaging performance as a methodology for both research and teaching has also figured prominently in my work. And I'm interested in hearing as knowing. What do we learn through our ears that's not based on kind of the discursive vocabulary of language, whether, whether spoken or read? What is it that we can learn through, through our ears? So this lecture will be in five parts, beginning with invitation, contextualization, collaboration, representation, and emancipation. Let's start with invitation. 
The ethnographies of ethnomusicologists and anthropologists often begin with stories of arrival or invitation, and mine is no different. The year was 1995. I was on unpaid leave in Jakarta, where my husband Dan was working for the Ministry of Environment, and our four-year-old son Hansen was attending playgroup. I read in the Jakarta Post that there was a festival of Islamic arts at the National Istiqlal Mosque, and I was interested in the fashion show. By the time we negotiated the traffic and arrived on the campus of the Masjid Istiqlal, the National Mosque, the fashion show was over. But I happened upon a contest for the Azan, the Islamic call to prayer. One by one, contestants ascended to a modest platform and performed their virtuosic mu and musical calls to a panel of judges who were giving them numerical scores on such things as pronunciation, breath control, musicality, and so forth. I was amazed, and when they took a break, summoned up all the courage and all the Indonesian language that I had acquired at that point, and timidly said something like, are you really doing what I think you're doing? You can laugh. <laughs> That's what I say. The good-natured judges enthusiastically ushered me back to their break room, where they all drank tea, some of them enjoying the pungent, kretek, clove cigarettes that you can smell even when you step off the plane in Jakarta. This gentleman, Pak Morsid, explained that he taught Lagu al-Qur'an, or the Arab melodies of the Quran, at a women's college for Quranic studies, and that I should come to class next Tuesday afternoon. We exchanged numbers, and I came home stunned and exhilarated by the experience. Tuesday afternoon came, and although I studied the map and tried to figure out where this place was, I chickened out. That night, I got a call on the house phone. You didn't show up, said the deep voice in Indonesian. It was Pak Morsid. We'll see you Thursday, he affirmed. Were this gentleman not to have reiterated his invitation, I probably would not be giving the 14th TAC lecture this evening. My regular attendance of classes and events at the Institute Ilmu al-Qur'an, Institute for the Science or the Study of the Qur'an, a college for women, afforded the opportunity not only to practice with students in class, but also to meet the faculty of male and female professors, all of them well-known, uh, all of them well-known reciters and teachers, and all of them engaged in what I call the business of religion. And this is uh, Maria Ulfa, who has been my longtime uh, colleague. She's, many of you have met her um, at either uh, a conference or here on campus at William and Mary. And I'll talk about her a little bit more later. Contextualization. Indonesia is an archipelago of 13 to 18,000 islands, more than 900 of which are inhabited. The country's population is about 270 million. Of 300 ethnic groups and 700 known languages, Javanese as ethnicity and language is by far dominant. The whole country uh, uh, speaks and reads and uh, um, communicates in Bahasa Indonesia, the national language, but Javanese is uh, very, very prevalent as both ethnicity, population, and language. Indonesia and the United States are comparable in size and almost in population. They're also comparable in diversity, in democracy, and in recent trends like populism and nativism in the real politique of the public sphere. Historians agree that Indonesia has been connected to an Indian Ocean world of travel and trade for all of its recorded history via the Maritime Silk Road. So here, I'm going to use my pointer. Let's see. Here is the Indian Ocean. Here is Yemen. Here's Oman. Here's the east coast of Africa. Well, that's a little bit of an insert there. It's going to. So here's the Indian Ocean. And around, you can see the roots here. There's Sri Lanka. And then here's the tip of, of Sumatra. This is called Aceh and then through the Malacca Straits, and then out to the China Sea and out to the Pacific. That's the Maritime Silk Road. We have evidence of Omani sailing boats, or dhows, shipwrecked off the coast of Indonesia that date to the ninth century. Let's, I'll show you where that is, right there, right in that area. And uh, today, the Strait of Malacca, a 500-mile waterway, right here, 500-mile waterway between the coasts of Sumatra and Malaysia 
uh, and the main shipping lane between the, the Indian and Pacific Oceans is still one of the busiest channels in the world, one of the busiest shipping channels in the world. Centuries of travel regulated by the monsoon winds of the Indian Ocean carried all kinds of cultural exchange, including language, melody, and religion. Beginning mostly on the coast and then moving inland, the Islamization of Indonesia was a gradual process that, I argue, is constantly reworked in the contemporary moment. Of course, air travel and mass media in the 20th century have brought cultural exchange around the Indian Ocean and from the Arab world to warp speed. So what interests me in this transmigration of ideas and practices is the development in the Indonesian archipelago of Islamic musical arts, or what they call Sini Musik Islam, and the role they play in the creative expressions of religious and cultural identity. About 85% of Indonesia's 270 million citizens are Muslims, with Catholics, Protestants, Hindus, Buddhists also present, Hindus and Buddhists also present. According to Panchasila, the five guiding principles of Indonesian democracy established by the country's first president, Sukarno, in 1945, belief in God is required or expected of all citizens. But just as is the case in a large democracy like the US, with piety comes variety. Today, Indonesia sends 22,000 to Saudi Arabia every year for the annual pilgrimage, or the Hajj, and thousands more on the lesser pilgrimage, the Umrah. Again, this is more than any other country. In the early 17th century, the Dutch, with their East India Company, VOC, followed closely on the heels of, the, of Portuguese colonial merchants, active since the 1500s in the spice trade of cinnamon, nutmeg, pepper, and cloves. The VOC established productive and lucrative colonial rule due to the institutionalization of forced indentured labor, slavery, on plantations that were cultivating tea and coffee, cacao, tobacco, rubber, sugar, and opium. Roads, bridges, irrigation systems, schools, and hospitals were also byproducts of Dutch colonialism, and post-colonial relations between the Netherlands and Indonesia remain dynamic to this day. After invasion and occupation by the Japanese during World War II, Indonesia became independent in 1945. So here you have a list of Indonesian presidents since independence, the most infamous of which are the first two, Sukarno for 22 years and Suharto for 32 years. That was followed by Suharto's uh, vice president, Habibi, for just one year, the first, and then the first democratically elected leader, Abdurrahman Wahid, or Gusdur, who served for two years. Uh, his vice president then took over, the daughter of Sukarno, named Megawati Sukarno Putri, yes, a woman, followed by Yudhoyono and the current president, Jokowi. What I'd like to point out in this era of independence is the Asia-Africa Conference of 1955 that brought together a number of newly independent nations. While religion was not the sole focus of this conference, it was one of the themes, and this was the first context for an international contest in Quranic recitation. In spring 2017, during my last sabbatical, and supported by a Fulbright Fellowship, I was in the midst of six months of ethnographic research in Java and Sumatra. While hardly comprehensive, I visited individuals and communities from Banda Aceh on the western tip of Sumatra to Malang, East Java, thus building on ethnographic fieldwork and research that began 20 years ago. And I just also wanted to point out, can we see it? Uh, Palu, where they've had the, the, the terrible tsunami, is right here. And then Lombok, where they had the earthquake, uh, is right over there. Right? And Bali is right in between Java and Lombok. The participation of women with their bodies and voices in the public expression of religion in Indonesia is notable, in part because of its alleged limitations in other Muslim-majority countries. And here we, have, uh, um, here we have Sheikh Abdullah Bayoumi from Egypt's Al-Azhar Mosque and University. And he's describing the power of women's voices. 
Now, the clip begins with the recording of the great Egyptian singer, Um Kulthum, who died in 1975, but who is legendary throughout the Islamic world for her voice, her career, her repertoire, and because her singing was grounded in religious vocal arts, including Quranic recitation. So let's hear what Sheikh Abdullah Bayoumi has to say from the authoritative Al-Azhar Mosque in Egypt. <laughs> يعني احنا عندنا يقول لولا المتشابهات لغنت به البنات يعني القران الكريم له قواعده له احكامه ما بتلاقيش واحده ست تغني بالقران ليه لان القران معجزه وله وله ضوابط في عندي بنات بييجوا يحفظوا وبيقراوا قدامي عشان اعلمهم القراءه السليمه ولكن هي هي في احتفال من الاحتفالات يقولوا لها تعالي مثلا اقراي اذا كان هناك نسوه في في الاحتفال وهتقرا للسيدات وليس هناك رجال خلاص لان صوت المراه زي ما احنا عارفين يعتبر ك بالنسبه للاسلام يعني احنا بنقول هنا في قراءه القران طبعا صوت المراه عوره صوت المراه عوره so that's the authoritative voice of, a, of a, a religious leader from Al-Azhar. And it should be pointed out that not everybody would agree with him, even in Egypt. But he says, you know, the voice of a woman is, um, is Aura. The influential Arab feminist writer and professor at Harvard Divinity School, Leila Ahmed, defines the term Aura as shameful and defective things. Its meanings include blind in one eye, blemished, defective, the genital, the genital area, generally parts of the body that are shameful and must be concealed, women's bodies, women's voices, and women. But when I queried Indonesians in the business of religion about the power and potential danger of women's voices, I was repeatedly told that a woman's voice is biasa saja, just regular. Here is an example of the female voice in Indonesia. In this clip, Maria Ulfa, who, you, who I mentioned before, my uh, major colleague, um, she's teaching Quranic recitation to female and male students at her Pondok Pesantren, her religious boarding school. I'd like you to notice four things, and I've written them down there at the bottom of the slide. Note first, the single breath phrase. I challenge you to, to take your breath in and hold it while this reciter is reciting. Second, note her use of the microphone. Uh, Third, note the participation and reaction of the fellow students around her. Note also the green divider as the camera pans around the room. And then finally, the way that Maria Ulfa demonstrates the Arab melodic mode and the ornamentation of this particular melody. <laughs> You can hear everybody is practicing right behind her and she's saying you know you have to go, yeah yeah don't go don't just go yeah that's boring right you have to go yeah yeah and she's demonstrating this little ornament the woman's voice in indonesia collaboration beginning with my first visit to the institute for the study of the quran i quickly discovered that they were as interested in me as i was in them 
Michelle Kesliak, our colleague at the University of Virginia, wisely describes the process of field work where we come to know others by making ourselves known to them. Not only was I expected to participate in classes, students and professors were interested in me because of my familiarity with Arab music, my ability to perform songs and improvisations on the oud, the lute that you just heard earlier, and our common interest in the Arab melodic system called makamat, what this woman is so confidently demonstrating in that last video. Last spring, I was able to more deeply investigate various kinds of music, thus branching out from my earlier focus on the culture of Quranic recitation and expanding my experience of Islamic musical arts. And so these are just some uh, shots of the different kinds of performances um, that, uh, that I was invited to do. One of the groups with which I've been involved is Kiai Kanjeng, whose leader, during our first interview in January 2000, invited me to go on tour with the group as a guest artist. I kept missing them and he said, look, why don't you just come on tour with us and then you can hang out and play and figure out uh, what we do. Emha Ainu Najib is a poet, playwright, grassroots activist, singer, political advisor, and champion of social justice. He has a staying power that is remarkable. His gatherings, which occur all over the archipelago, attracting audiences in the thousands, routinely include local figures, including musicians, actors, religious leaders, politicians, and me. Grounded in the collective singing of religious texts, bordering on almost a kind of performative Sufism, combine, combined with gamelan music and, a, and a, a kind of a rock and roll lineup in the background, and they call this gamelan dakwa, and the word dakwa from Arabic or dakwa in Indonesian is a term that combines an idea of sort of missionary zeal and service or deepening of the religion. I believe their troupe is reflective and generative of a Javanese Islam that celebrates local culture and the grassroots while prioritizing social justice, modeling a posture of tolerant piety. Now that shot was from 2010. Um, and since I first toured with the group in 2004, I try to, I try to intersect with their busy touring schedule wherever possible. In, in spring 2017, I met the group before their show in Malang, East Java. And here, uh, Ari Blotong, the violinist, is going over the set list. And you can see in red where they've put me. This is, they've, they've planned, this is what we're going to do with Ibu Ann. That's me. Um, what, one of those, you'll, uh, our students will know that Ghanili is one of the songs that we did, and then, and then another uh, common song, Uskudara. Um, all right. So using music for research, using music as a methodology for research, not only helps me to understand through engaging as a participant observer what is happening, it also gives audiences, sometimes numbering in the hundreds or thousands, an idea of what I am up to. This kind of publicity, more than any other method, I believe, keeps me and my work honest and above, above board. So let's have a look at this next clip. So here I am. I usually sit in the, in the very back row, but sometimes I've, I've been on stage with this group, I don't know, a dozen times. Sometimes I'll just sit in the back row. Sometimes I'll come up and we'll have a huge Q&A, um, and I can tell you more about that. Um, sometimes I, I film. Sometimes I play. They just invite me to sit in. It's a really, and their performances usually last from about 8 or 9 in the evening till about 2 in the morning. So it's quite a marathon. Um, it's, it's really quite amazing. Um, all right, at the end of this clip, the following clip that I'm going to show you, which I am filming with this phone. So I'm sitting in the back. I hear a song that I've written about before. I'm like, oh, I want to catch this. So I'm sitting in the back where you saw me, and I start filming with this phone, and I'm filming away. But all of a sudden, the song stops, and he addresses the crowd, and this is what he has to say. I had no idea this was coming up. He says, everyone, it turns out that we have a guest from America who from far, far away arrived in Indonesia. And we've been looking for the possibility of meeting. And so finally, we meet here in Samarang, a professor by the name of Mrs. Professor Dr. Ann Rasmussen. <laughs> Can you give her a microphone? And he turns to me, and he says, Ibu, Mrs., this is the 470th anniversary of the city of Samarang. Is your city as old as that? Well, 
naturally, I was a little flabbergasted, and I'm sitting there with my phone, you know, filming him from the back. And so I say, uh, my, my university was founded in uh, 1693, so it's more than 300 years old, so not quite as old as Samarang, but almost. And then he says to the audience, this person is a doctor and a researcher of ethnomusicology, and especially she is researching Islamic music and Quranic recitation. She's a close associate of Ibu Maria Ofa. Let's hear this in... Ini ternyata kita punya tamu dari Amerika. Jauh, jauh-jauh datang ke Indonesia terus mencari kemungkinan-kemungkinan pertemuan. Akhirnya kita bisa ketemu di Semarang. Ini ada seorang profesor namanya Ibu Profesor Dr. N. Rosmasen. Jadi bisa dikasih ini telepon. Give her a mic. Bu, ini ulang tahun Semarang ke 470. Apakah ada di Amerika kota setua kota Indonesia? 470. 70. Kalau universitas saya dibangun uh, 16, 5, 6, 1693. Jadi uh, 400 tahun lebih, tapi tidak sampai 470. Oke. Okay. <laughs> Ini ibu ini seorang dokter dan peneliti etnomusikologi dan khusus beliau mempelajari musik-musik Islam, kiraatul Quran dan sebenarnya beliau teman dekatnya ibu Maria Ufa, Korean Indonesia yang sangat legendaris. Ya. The music of Kiai Kanjeng enthusiastically combines the local and the global, synthesizing Javanese, Indonesian, and Arab musical practices and techniques in obvious ways. Let me share with you uh, an example of another kind of Islamic music. And I have some real life examples here that you can come up and, and uh, have a look at afterwards. Pictured here are frame drums called Rabana. Okay, let me go back. Great, yes. Uh, frame drums called Rabana. The physical variety and playing techniques of these instruments, decidedly Muslim and decidedly related to the material and performance culture of Arab music, fascinate me. How are these traditions created? Are they imported directly from the Arab world? Are they derivative? Are these processes ongoing or locked in a distant past? Fieldwork during this past stint in Indonesia also had me pat tracking down the drum making industry. So here we are in outside Surabaya on the northeast corner of Java, and H.M. Nasihan Sanusi has a Pangrajian Rabana, or a Rabana home industry, that was established in 1956 by his father. He produces thousands of drums and frame drums every year. For example, recently, the Malaysian government ordered 6,000 marwas, which are these drums, and Rabana for school programs there. Here, Ibu Sanus, Sanusi, the, the, uh, his wife, is showing me the warehouse of sheepskins, and repeatedly people told me, patina, female sheepskins. So this home industry employs only three people who produce about 10 to 20 instruments a day. While the Rabana is distinctly Southeast Asian, we can draw a direct and distinct correlation between practices in Indonesia and the Arab Gulf through this drum, this one here, the marwas, or plural marawis. Um, so, and this picture is from my research in Oman in, this was in 2012, I believe. And here we are in Jakarta, one of three Islamic music instrument shops, and look at all the, all the marwas they have ready to ship out. This is what they sound like in performance.
So this is pretty typical. I was invited to a wedding, and they played their wedding, and then you know afterwards I was just trying to kind of trying to chat them up backstage, and I said, you know, can you show me? Can I like record a little clip of this? And um, and they said, well, what should we do? And I said, well, here, lend me your oud, and I'll play something, and you play it back. So you know, just completely unrehearsed, and I just gave my recorder to somebody else, and other people were filming and so forth. And then I say, great. Does it have a name? And he said, yes. Marwas patterns, which, you know, not, not anything specific at all, um, but, but some pretty exciting stuff. Um, and again, because of their associations, associations with Arab culture and performance, such groups and their music are automatically thought to be infused with an Islamic character. Let's talk about representation. Representing the people and communities with whom we work is without a doubt the most important responsibility of the ethnographer. The nuances of this responsibility and its manifestations do not translate very well into the kind of professional capital required for promotion, publication, and tenure. And I reflected broadly on this conundrum while doing field work and at the same time being president of my academic society. While in the field this past time, and note that even the notion of being in and out of the field for field work rests on pillars of colonialist intervention and scientific interest in the other. Anyway, while being in the field this past time, I felt it was actually the acts of micro-diplomacy in which one can engage daily that are in many ways more satisfying and productive than the aggregation and distillation of such experiences into conference papers and articles for publication, although I do enjoy that part and that process as well. So one aspect of this micro-diplomacy was to give presentations, and more presentations, and more presentations about my work. The number of academic presentations that I was asked to give surprised me, but again, was a way of getting to know others by making myself known to them. And here are just some examples. And so I would show up, and I would have, an, have a contact, and I would come to meet people and say, great, you're here. And this is like Monday. So can you give a talk? Sure, how about Thursday? And then I'd show up Thursday, and there would be, you know, 200 people in the room, right? Um, so it was really quite remarkable, um, the openness uh, of people to hearing how I uh, framed what they did, and also, I think, a source of great pride. And it was also wonderful to me, because then, of course, people would come up and tell me about their worlds, and often ask me for advice, and send me emails with pictures, and, um, and so on and so forth. I was pleased to involve uh, my closest colleagues, Maria Olfa, and Dadi Darmadi um, at, uh, this, is play, this is called At America. It's a cultural center that's organized by the uh, American Embassy in Jakarta. Um, Dadi Darmadi is an American trained anthropologist and professor at the Islamic University in Jakarta, and Maria Olfa, of course, and they've both been colleagues for more than 20 years. So another aspect of this realm of representation. Oh. Another aspect of this realm of re representation is the two tours that I have organized for Maria Olfa in 1999 and in 2016. And together we have co-presented at Harvard, Brown, Boston College, Haverford, the University of Maryland, Georgetown, George Mason, William and Mary, the Smithsonian Institution, and the conferences of the Middle East Studies Association and the Society for Ethnomusicology. Introducing this phenomenal female scholar, teacher, and performer to a multicultural mix of Americans, both Muslims and non-Muslims, has produced countless revelatory moments among our audiences. And next semester, in conjunction with the Freer Sattler Gallery, I hope to capture some of Maria Olfa's last tour in a digital humanities project that can be accessed openly and worldwide. Finally, emancipation. In the final section of this evening's presentation, I'd like to make a few comments about emancipation. Rooted in the Orientalist frameworks of European intellectual, political, and artistic history, the tendency to otherize and essentialize Muslims has been rejuvenated in the contemporary moment due to conflicting but complementary motives. On the one hand, there's a pressing need and desire among non-Muslims to come and know and understand to come to know and understand the peoples and cultures of the Islamicate world. 
This genuine curiosity is balanced, however, by an impatient requirement to command, contain, and control knowledge about Islam and Muslims in order to establish some sort of causality between religion, difference, similarity, and conflict among peoples and cultures. Whether the clash of civilizations, the discursive aftermath of 9-11, or our present-day Muslim ban, these unitary and unifying ideas, often glibly deployed, go against the grain of particularity that is produced by my ethnographically situated experience of humanity in Indonesia. So now, a few notes on the Muslim sisterhood. Women are certainly present in Islamic arts. Boys and girls, men and women, uh, practice, perform, and play together and alongside one another. So here you have, this is a, a contest for this genre called, what is it called? Uh, banjari, I can look down here, that's too small. Uh, yes, uh, banjari, this lomba banjari. So here are the, the, the judges, and these are two groups. This is the group at the public university from Malang, and so you'll note that the guys have the instruments and the women are singing. Again here, the women are singing and the guys have the instruments. It's more likely for women to play instruments when they are in an all-female ensemble, such as Nasideria, an all-women religious pop group now in their fourth generation. Notably, these women all got their start as Quranic reciters. And you can follow them on Instagram. They constantly post. It's wonderful. Um, you can follow any of these people practically on Instagram. Uh, um, because women's voices and uh, their bodies are biasa saja, just regular, it's not hard to find women, particularly young women, performing in a variety of configurations. Above is a concert uh, at a religious boarding school, and below these two photos are a battle of the bands where young women belted out their renditions of Adele, Someone Like You, The Cranberries, Zombie, and The Final Countdown, a global hit of the mid-80s that still resonates in the international public ear, obviously. The music that interests me reinforces and teaches a life of piety among various walks of life. It's also a way that people have fun, create social bonds, and project individual and communal identities. In this clip of Mature Women, an amateur group prepares for an upcoming regional competition of the Islamic music genre, Terbang Jidor. Let's have a listen. The text is in Arabic. The instruments are rabana, so this one, that one down there, and uh, bass drum. So hello, marching band, and thank you, colonialism, for that instrument. Um, the melody is a, a very well-known tune in Javanese. <laughs> So they're getting ready for a competition and they're wearing their sargam, their, their uniforms. And this is a, you know, kind of mi l probably middle, lower, middle class neighborhood uh, of women who were incredibly welcoming to me um, when I was in, East, in the East Javanese city of Malang. Um, all right. Although public performance, uh, although public in performance and thus apparently emancipated Women as a marked category continue to be a litmus test for and of public discourse and political debate. The intensification of the jilbab, the headscarf, is one fetishized example of women's bodies at the intersection of politics, morality, and in the words of Musta Mulia right, uh, on the right, uh, in her words, capitalism. And I'd love to talk more about that. Hussein Muhammad, who is a feminist cleric or uh, ulama, 
uh, worries about 400 regions that have local laws limiting women's activities. Domestic, like for example, riding motorcycles or going out after eight o'clock at night. Domestic violence and underage marriage are also concerns of activist feminists. And these kinds of trends are rationalized by patriarchal claims of religious propriety, almost always. As a counterbalance, women's role, as a counterbalance, women's issues and women's roles in the prevention of radical Islam, or what people call Islam radical, are very much on the table. So last spring, there was an international conference of female ulama, or uh, religious leaders, um, that brought uh, female religious leaders to Indonesia from all over the world to discuss just this issue. This conference and its theme, Women's Roles in the Prevention of Radical Islam, is another example of the crossroads where gender meets religion meets political activism. Signs of growing conservatism. Oh, in, oh, signs of growing conservatism, intolerance and extremism manifest in a variety of contexts. This one a bit more gentle. On the way to this event at public high school number two in Lamongan, East Java, uh, we were in the car and school officials boasted that as of rather recently, all girls now wear the jilbab even though this is not a requirement in public schools. So they were just telling us about their school and that all girls now wear the headscarf. Well, I said, well, what about non-Muslim girls? And they said, well, they go to private schools. And so I said, well, is this a good thing? If it's not required, is it a good thing? And so again, we can return to ideas of peer pressure, of capitalism, of, um, of, of what, what's trendy, of conformity, and so forth. Now earlier, I mentioned physical size, diversity, multiculturalism and democracy as attributes that Indonesians and Americans share. Here are a few others. When I arrived in January 2017, professors at the National University in Malang brought me up to speed. Their experience of racist nativism, political populism, and religious conservatism is being spread by Berita Palsu, fake news. So this is before I even hardly knew what it was here. Uh, all of this Brita Palsu, this fake news, was being spread by Medsosh, social media. Indonesians love to make uh, abbreviations. They called it Medsosh. This is the opiate of the masses, they told me. And people simply copa, copy and paste from one site to another. And those tightening the reins of intoler intolerance were not leaders with religious rigorous training. Rather, they were just exemplars of Islam Google, people who just surf the net to find out stuff about Google. And this is a very serious phenomenon, what, uh, what is posted on the web and who hosts websites. So radical Islam does have a real presence in Southeast Asia, and much of it is fueled by multinational or extranational forces, things are, that are imported to Indonesia from abroad. I was thrilled in a rather macabre way to be caught up in this demonstration in Solo in East Java by complete happenstance. And Jordan, if you're there, there's your hotel, right there. Um, so the impetus for this demonstration, which I'm gonna show you a clip of, is the controversy that surrounded the incumbent mayor uh, and these events framed my research from January to June 2017 and made relevant all kinds of questions about social justice, about civil rights, multiculturalism, and religious intolerance. So just briefly here, uh, this uh, uh, incumbent mayor um, was uh, uh, allegedly blasphemed the Quran. There was a runoff election for the, uh, for the uh, or excuse me, a, a governor, runoff election for the governor, but he was, he had earlier been accused of this blasphemy of the Quran. There were demonstrations all over, uh, all over the archipelago, but particularly in Java um, in November and December 2016, and then on into, Jan in, into 2017, or in, and this one that you were gonna see is in May of 2017. And there was trial, conviction, of blasphemy and a two-year prison term, and he resigned from office. So let me show you um, a little bit of that demo. <laughs> Hello. 
sampai umat Islam sampai tetap ini tetap bersatu atas dengan orang asli. All right, that's enough of that. Um, let me leave you with just a, a couple of important takeaways from my research, and these are things that I think are uh, a little bit elusive or maybe even counterintuitive. Some of the larger particularities on the scale of tolerance and intolerance, intolerance relate to intersecting realms of tradition and modernity and education, either religious education or public high schools and university education. So whereas we might associate modernity with an open, with open-minded and westernized views, it is actually traditionalists those well-grounded in religious education and orientation who are champions of inclusivity and who recognize the centuries of an Indonesian Islam characterized by tolerance and creativity. Women's voices, women's bodies, voices and activities in the business of religion are welcome here. Tendencies of intolerance are cultivated rather in public high schools and universities, often among well-heeled BMW driving elite, whose roots are not in the Pondok Pesantren, not in the religious boarding schools, but rather in public high schools and universities, technical universities, and so forth. It's widely acknowledged that these hardliners, while they do have their cells in Indonesia, find their impetus and inspiration from sources and organizations outside the country, not only from the Arab world and elsewhere in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, but from places like Australia. So to summarize, okay, so, so basically I'm saying that this is where you find kind of the tolerant uh, uh, Islam that's really quite characteristic of Indonesia. It's traditional, it's grounded in a very solid religious identity and, um, and all kinds of traditions, some of which are very Islamic and some of which are very, uh, you know, very local, whether they be Javanese or Sumatran or wherever you live. So, to summarize, why Islam in Indonesia and why Islamic musical arts? The rich variety of Islamic arts in Indonesia should not be a surprise given the country's demographics. Some believe Indonesia's overall, uh, overall approach to religion, and when I say some, I mean scholars and lay people, uh, believe Indonesia's overall approach to religion and democracy should serve as a model for other Muslim countries or countries with Muslim majority populations in the Islamic world. With their piety and their serious approach to religious studies and the Arabic language, even some in Saudi Arabia consider them, consider Indonesians to be a model for the future. Although they're sympathetic to Muslims worldwide, Indonesians are perplexed about conflict everywhere else in the global ummah, in the global uh, Muslim community, and they want to keep such business out of Indonesia. As one of my acquaintances said last year, we wonder why Muhammad wasn't born here in Indonesia. I have found, so this is, I just have to tell you what this is. This is the, the, um, the uh, simultaneous recitation of the entire Quran. Uh, you say one, two, three, go. Everybody has one part. There are 30 parts in the Quran. It's, it, it, it's a wonderful cacophony of, of the, the embodiment of the text, both for audience and, uh, uh, and, and uh, performers. And you can hear uh, examples on this on the website that goes with my book. Um, and this is actually at the grandson, the, the grandson of uh, Suharto's house. And it is uh, a ceremony for, a blessing ceremony, very Javanese, for a seven month pregnant uh, woman. One of the family is seven months pregnant, so they have a kind of a blessing ceremony. Half of it's very Muslim and the other half is very Javanese. So we wonder why Muhammad wasn't born in Indonesia. Finally, I have found the extraordinary generosity, collaborative spirit, and can do fast modus operandi among people who have welcomed me into their world to be astonishing, impressive, and humbling. And I thank them for facilitating my research and enriching my life. And finally, thank, here, here are some of them up there. And at the bottom, I'd like you to thank, I'd like to thank you, also Martha and Carl Tack, Jane and Val Cushman and your committee 
for 100 Years of Women at the College of William and Mary, and to Steve Tewksbury and the TAC Team Wranglers. Give them a round of applause. Thank you very much.